Father, we thank you that you've given us your word, for truly your word's a light and a lamp. Truly your word is lessons to be learned and application to be taught and escape from treachery and yet the road to blessings. I don't know how you do it, God. It still blows me away that on some book I've built my life and yet I don't regret any second of it. God, may there be one person here that has never built their life on this book and may today they realize, wow, that book is supernatural. Bless us. Holy Spirit, we invite you to have your way in our hearts and our minds. There's nothing we want to hold back from you today. Nothing, God. Nothing. Read us, God. As we read your word, may your word read us and instruct us in the way that we should go and teach us and may we grow old and never depart from it, God. We love you and we love your word. Have your way now fully in us. In Christ Jesus, amen. Amen. Sorry, guys. Chapter 16, the book of Judges. Chapter 16, the book of Judges. We continue our verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter study through God's Word. Today we're in the book of Judges, in the 16th chapter, one of the most famous chapters in all of Scripture because it's something that the world has adapted and the church has adopted. And it's one of those crazy chapters that you read it and you go, oh, wow, that's where that came from. And by the time you're finished, you'll be saying like me, now, why do we make that guy out a hero again? I don't know. We're going to continue and finish the saga that is Samson's life. Samson, the duplicitous man who served Christ by day and served his flesh by night. The man who yet is mentioned in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and yet was probably one of the most unfaithful men with God's provisions that there ever was. A man who could have forged Israel into a nation, an army so strong it could have defeated its enemies and been set free, but yet couldn't say no to his desire. And I think what, as a man, I hate about Samson most is the similarities between myself and him. I think as ladies we could even you all can even look at it and say the same and there's just too much there that that I don't want to know about but with that thought in mind verse 1 chapter 16 Samson and Delilah now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her stop right there please not a good thing for a man of God just letting you know that from the start what the heck is he doing First of all, in Gaza, which was the city of the Philistines. Second of all, going into a harlot. I have no idea, but there he was. Verse 2. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, in the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. And Samson lay low till midnight. Give me your attention, please. He goes down to Gaza in the city, finds a harlot, because that's his reputation. They knew. All they had to do was set the trap and he'd fall for the bait. All they had to do is put out there that there were some new prostitutes in Gaza. There was new prostitutes amongst the city of the Philistines. There was something there that would tempt him. I can't help but think that the enemy's plot and plan for us has not changed doesn't have to be sexual in nature. It could be that the enemy knows where you live and there you are all the time. What is it that freaks you out, that pulls you away from God? For you young kids, man, for you young guys, I know now, more than anything else, it's those video games. And you can't say no to them, you can't stop desiring them, and yet you can't stop playing them. And then when you're finished, you know you've wasted your time, you know you shouldn't have been on them, but the next day, come play video games. We'll have a great time. You'll get to the next level this time. There's somebody in Thailand who's playing and they want to play with you too. There you are. Xbox 300. And you get off and your eyes are like this. I've seen it, believe me. They're like this. You have this blue glow on your face. Were you playing video games all night? (laughs) 
You know when something has you, when it causes you to sin all the more. It's one thing to sin. It's another thing to lie about your sin. When your sin has you lying, then it's called a besetting sin. It's an entrapment, a snare, a bear trap. It's really cool. Um, my pastor, Pastor Jim Coy, he has a real old-fashioned bear trap. And one time we did, a, we taught this big men's uh, conference at Calvary Fort Lauderdale together, and he brought it. I'm telling you, the thing was like this big. And one guy's got to stand on one side, the other guy's got to stand on the other, you got to pull this piece of metal, like, yeah, and you're afraid because the thing snaps back. I'm telling you, it will go right into your bone. I'm not talking about, I'm talking, boom, and he sets the trap. We help him set it, and we go, and then he takes a two by four, and he talks all about sin, and then he takes a two by four at the end, and he goes, he puts it in there, he goes, bang, and it goes three quarters of the way through the two by four. All you got to do is shake the two by four a little bit, and it pops in half. That's what sin besetting is. It grabs you, it keeps you longer than you want to stay, it takes you further than you want to go, and here he was again. Isn't it a shame? Samson wasn't known for his great strength. He was known for his great weakness. As strong as he was in the flesh, was as weak as he was in the flesh. Man, do I hate this guy. I hate him because when I look in the mirror, I see him. There he is. How strong you are sometimes. What great heights you've gotten to, and yet, look how low you've come. Oh, this guy. So he goes down to the Gazite city, finds the harlot that he really likes, and he hangs out with her all night. The Gazites find out that he took the bait, so they surround the city and they say, when he gets up in the morning, we're going to kill him. We're tired of this guy. There he is. But at midnight he arose, he took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now if it's a certain hill that's there, uh, still there today, that faces over Hebron, that's about 38 miles. So he goes at midnight, because the city gates were locked, and he literally grabs the doors, he pulls him up, gate, bar, and all, throws him on his shoulders. Now, again, you guys have heard me say this. You guys that have been here for the last few weeks have been looking at Samson. I can believe anything the Bible says. I can, I'm telling you, there's no doubt in my heart, in my mind, that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe a man rose from the dead. For some reason, my mind and my flesh always struggle with this superpower thing. It's like, here he is, the Hulk in the flesh, you know? But I faith through it. I believe it because it's God's Word. Not because I feel it, or I think it, or I don't feel it, or I don't think it. I believe it because it's God's Word. So he pulls up these gates, these bars, these doors, throws them on his shoulders, hikes 30 some odd miles, Verse 4, afterward it happened, I love that, afterward it happened, it happened, hey guys, I don't know where you are in your life, I don't know what it is that sits and waits for you, but let me tell you how the devil works. He looks to see where your weakness is, and he tempts you or makes you busy. He either tempts you to be lazy or tempts you to be too busy. If he can't get you with laziness, he will bless your business, he will bless your job so much, you'll have so many hours, you'll have so much business, you just can't make it to church on Wednesday. And so once a week's enough. There's nothing in the Bible that says I've got to go to church twice a week. And here, never knowing when that last it's so insane. We, we, we keep doing our sins, 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 and we think, I'm going to get up and, and get out of it just like I always have. Hold on there, let's continue. Afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. It's kind of well agreed that Delilah was a temple prostitute. Her name suggests it. Um, 
she was a, a Philistine woman. Uh, um, and there he did. He, th then it happened. He fell in love with a temple prostitute. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him that we may bind him and afflict him and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Give me your attention. The lords of the Philistines. There were five cities of the Philistines. I don't remember their names, otherwise I'd look really cool right now, but... There were five of them, and they offered her 1,100 pieces of silver each. 5,500 pieces of silver would weigh over 100 pounds. The average wage was two pieces of silver for about a month at that time. This woman would be set for life. Now for a temple prostitute, no more dancing, no more selling herself, that's it. So whatever feelings she had for Samson, if she ever had any feelings for Samson, 1,100 pieces of silver times five, bye-bye. <laughs> and the lords of the Philistines offered her this money. She took it. All she had to do was find out how to get to Samson. Samson had killed. He was rebellious. He was a modern-day Robin Hood. Samson was like, mo like, was like a modern day, uh, a biblical times Robin Hood. He stole from the rich, killed the rich, gave to the poor. Maybe sometimes he didn't. Now think about it. This guy was killing people. The Jews didn't like him. The Philistines hated him. Same thing. Why doesn't this guy turn out to be a hero? Why doesn't this guy... Don't you want this story to turn out better? You ever read something and hope it turns out better the second time? Do you know how many times I've watched the movie Jaws and hoped that it would turn out different? <laughs> Why does Quint have to die at the end of that movie every single time? I love that guy. I don't want to go on. I really don't. The rest of it's just terrible. Let's just call it a night and pray. Father, we... No, I can't do that. I can't. I can't. i got to teach this thing. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. Now listen, ladies, I don't know if you know this. Some of you may know this. I know men this dumb. <laughs> I've been a man this dumb. I have. When I was in my late teens, early 20s, I loved this girl. I had a girlfriend, and I was foul, filthy, nasty cheater, but I just fell head over. And she wrecked my life, and I didn't care. She was that, back then we used the word cute. <laughs> now you ladies stole that word. Now everything's cute to you guys. Look at those shoes, they're so cute. Oh, that's a cute dress. They do, all the time. Subtlety has gone out the window. So entrenched. Pastor Bob used to always say this thing, it was great to me. He used to say, you know that the bottle of beer doesn't come with a warning label that says, after this one you'll be a full-blown alcoholic. You're not going to snort a line and underneath the line of coke it's going to say, now you're hooked all the way. You don't know when. It was... Cy Rogers, great preacher, guy came out of a homosexual lifestyle. He used to always say, men, you can play around it, but eventually you're going to fall into it. Don't play around your sin. Eventually you're going to fall in. And if you don't know this, and I've used this analogy before, and I've been living with it, it reminds me, it keeps me strong. The more you heap on your shoulders as a man, as a woman, okay, you're a man. Then what happens? You're a husband. Then what happens? You're a father. Then what happens? You're an employee or a business owner. Then what happens? You're in ministry. Then what happens? You're in charge of me, people. All these things, God gives you the broadest of shoulders to heap on yourself. Not understanding your house now, your life has become, well, the foundation is Christ, but the house you're building 
is a deck of cards. Did you ever build card houses? Anybody ever do that? When you hold that and you put it on, the, you've done that before? That's my life. It's card, man. My life is a, a card house. All these things that I am, a husband, a father, a business owner, a pastor, a minister, a coach, all these things. Guys, you ready? Gone. One kiss, one punch, gone. Now, if you're just a man, you're not. It's not. Your house isn't. You can do all those things. You can mess up because the foundation, which is Christ, is set and secure, steady. You could do that. If you're just a man here, you could go ahead and screw up. You just fall right back on the rock of Christ, and you go, God, forgive me, I messed up again. And he goes, no problem. But when you've heaped so much responsibility on your shoulders, when you've walked forward in these things, and you said, follow me. I'll take you there. You better take that seriously. My life, some of your lives, I know you. It's the same way. And you're trying to build more upon it and build more upon it and build more upon it. <clears throat> However, that foundation, according to Scripture, is just so many times you can go to that well. There's just so many times where you can say, God, I messed up again. Would you please forgive me? Just so many times. Let's come back to that again. Continuing. And Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Now just for you know, bowstrings were the in, insert, inerts of an animal. They would take the, the guts of an animal and they'd roll it up. And the fresher it was, the, the, the more... It, uh, the stronger it was because it actually gave a little bit. So if they took bowstrings, tie me up with bowstrings, I'm weak like any other man. Now it's obvious that Samson at this point, he knows she's just trying to get to me. It's okay. I'm going to enjoy my sin even though she thinks she's got me. I've got to tell you this great story. This is great. You guys are going to love this. Me and my wife knew this guy. And he was a wolf. He's always been a wolf. From the day we invited him to church, he the first month he was there, oh, he met this girl and he fell into sexual sin. Oh, it's okay, he's a new believer. And that broke up. And, and then he met this other girl and he came back and he swore he was going to be good, but then he messed that up too. And it happened for five, six, seven years over and over again. But he gave a lot of money when he came to church. But he was there to help fix up, you know. He was, he, was good, he was a good mechanic, he was, he was good at uh, carpentry work, but his life was a sad tale. Well, then he meets this married woman, and we told him, this is it for you, buddy. You do this, and we're through. Well, he did. He said, oh, I succumb to the flesh. I'll never forget him telling me that. I succumb to the flesh. Oh, you succumb to the flesh, that you did. He didn't realize. The black widow, she's a lot stronger than the wolf. And this woman devoured his life until he was nothing. And he still is. She wrecked him. She was married. Oh, but she played him. And she divorced her husband. She married him. And she faked cancer twice, faked pregnancy three times, forced him to marry her, took his money. Oh, my goodness. What a mess. And you, you might be sitting there going, does that really happen in ministry? <laughs> How many of you guys are in ministry more than 10 years? In ministry more than 10 years? Hands. Is that the craziest thing you've ever heard? Not even close, is it? No! I got better than that! Samson thought he was playing. He's going he's, he's to play the fiddle. Oh, yeah, yeah, if you, uh, you uh, tie me up with fresh bows, now, I don't know, and I don't want to get, like, disgusting with little kids. I don't know if they were playing some kind of game or something like that. I don't know what it was that he was going through his head. Oh, yeah, tie me up with bowstrings. But what happens? Uh, verse 8, so the lords of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried. She bound him with them. The men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room, and she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks 
when it touches fire. What a great picture. Isn't that, isn't that great? Does anybody ever have yarn and have a, a match? So you just, it just literally melts. It's, what do they call that? A, an allegory? Analogy. Analogy? Is that an analogy? No, there's a better word for it. Anyway, that was really visual. Yeah, I got the visual there. So the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. I mean, how many of you guys are saying to yourselves, look, by that time, I'm out of there. I had my fun. I'm done. I'm out. It's apparent what she's doing. Oh, no. Not even close. How many of you guys here don't know that if you smoke cigarettes, you stand a better chance of getting lung cancer? Probably will get cancer. Anybody not know that? Is that like shocking information? Any? How many of you don't know here if you smoke crack, it'll ruin your life. Anybody? Anybody? No? How many of you know here that if you sleep around, don't know here, that if you sleep around with prostitutes, you're gonna, your life's going to wind up a mess? Everybody knows that, huh? How many of you don't know here if you are into internet pornography, it will ruin every relationship you've ever had in every way? Every way. How many don't know? How many of you here think, say to yourself, now, the fact that nobody's saying anything means one of two things. Either everybody knows it, or you're already ashamed to say Because if you really didn't know, you would, hey, what's up, you guys, you don't know what you're talking about, Ryan. I'm on internet pornography every day, it's fine. My life's great with internet pornography. Prostitutes, no problem. I got them under control. Ladies. If you constantly read trash novels, how many of you think that they're actually going to come to pass in your life? That the more of those romance novels you read, eventually, that's what's going to happen. Your husband's going to die, and your man in shining armor is going to come riding in and take you away. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> you lust after what others have, ladies. And you can't reason, figure out why you're not fulfilled with your life. Why you're always sad. How many of you think that credit cards are definitely the way to happiness? It's okay, because you can just declare bankruptcy and the government will pay it off. Which is really us paying it off. Of course not. But yet, there we do it again. Look at the, don't, why do we, well, I'm hard on Samson. Again, I see so much of myself in this, in this schlep. He is schlep rock. You ever see schlep rock from, from the Flintstones? Here he is, in the flesh. So he said to her, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them, and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men were lying in wait, staying in the room, but he broke them off his arms like a thread. And then Samson said, You know what? You're a filthy tramp and you're trying to kill me. Get out. No, it doesn't say that, does it? Why? Because you don't know when you're stuck. You have the freedom to drink. You have the freedom to eat. I don't want to be hurting anybody's feelings here, and I am not going to, I'll just keep my eyes closed. Listen to me. If you don't eat right, if you keep stuffing your body with filthy food, junk food, you will look in the mirror and you will say, I hate you. You will. And you will be miserable. But does that mean anybody's going to stop? Exercise, eating right. You take care of the temple that God's given you so that you can serve Him faithfully. It's like Chuck Smith says. I said it on Sunday. If the barn needs painting, paint the barn. Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, 
if you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom. <laughs> now that would suggest, let me tell you something. Now to me, and I've heard preachers preach this, that means that he had dreadlocks. So check, check, check it out. If there were seven of these things, there's a lot more than seven. But imagine taking seven, there you go, seven of them. And there he is laying down. And she's got a loom. You guys know what a loom is? It looks almost like a, a, a sideways uh, harp. And you put the hair in it, and then you tie it with this, and you put it. And there he, she's tying his hair into a loom. Yeah, I got seven locks on my head. He's dreaded. You know, he must be dreaded out. Who knows if he was a brother or not? Who knows? <laughs> Could be. You know, you never know. Doesn't say Samson was white as old. You know, it doesn't. It says he was Jewish, and most of them were white, but... What do we really know? Would it matter? Does that, does that freak anybody out? You're prejudiced if it does. <laughs> Works both ways. So she wo wove it tightly with the batten of the loom and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep, pulled out the batten from the web and the, and the web from the loom. Then she said, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? I don't know how I can say that. I don't know. Maybe because you've tried to kill me four separate times. <laughs> you have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed till death. That's a drink of water. Yeah, it is. You know what? How many of you men look at this and go, oh, I totally know what she did. <laughs> Hands? No, no, you don't want to join me in this one. <laughs> oh, I'm the only one that's got to deal with this when I get home. Thanks a lot. Mm. I know exactly what she did. <laughs> Come on, please. Fine, fine. Then you sleep on the couch. Please, honey, please. I promise. Stop. No. No, no. No. Uh uh. Nobody? Anybody? I'm the only one? Thanks, guys. <laughs> Verse uh, 17. That he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. There it is. Now let me let you guys in a little secret that most of you probably don't know. Does anybody here really think that long hair was his strength? No. But it was his last bastion, his last connection to God. Because he'd already, I mean, you guys know he, he took the Nazarite, look what he says, he said, I took a Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow is not to, not to go near anything that was dead. And we know he broke that multiple times because not only did he kill people, but remember when he went in and took the honey out of the dead carcass? Not only did he do that, he gave it. It's like, and isn't that so much like us? Here we do, right? Guys, here we go. We know we shouldn't do something. Ladies, you know you shouldn't buy something. You know you shouldn't do something also. At Facebook, my ex. I'm just going to look at him. No, no, no. Well, I wonder if he's married. And there the fantasies begin to roll around your head. Listen, I've heard the craziest fantasies in the world. Well, maybe my husband will leave me, and maybe he's already cheated on me. And then I thought to myself, well, maybe, I mean, I've even had, I thought maybe my husband was going to die or something, and, and I didn't. How did you play this out in your head? Because the novels, the TVs, the chick flicks, and they lived happily ever after. And that's what you keep telling yourself. Marriage is hard. That's it. No more afterthought. It ain't easy. Never was. Never gonna be. The Lord never said that. I tell this to couples all the time who sit in my office and tell me how they want. They're done with each other. I say, okay. I throw them the Bible and I go, tell me what couple you want to emulate in the Bible. 
Show me which one. Show me the couple you want to emulate. Show me a married couple you want your life to look like. Uh, uh, um, uh. Abraham and Sarah? <laughs> David and Bathsheba? Anybody? No. Because they didn't exist then and they don't exist now. Marriage is hard. And that fantasy life that you've been sold don't exist, guys. Why do I tell my single brothers all the time the one quality you look for in a woman is what? She loves God more than she loves you. She loves God more than she loves you. Otherwise, forget it. That's why married men who have a woman that loves you more than she loves God, your job is to make her fall in love with Jesus. You must decrease that he might increase. Then you will have the woman of your dreams when she stops worshiping you and worships God. And it makes no logical, worthy, worldly sense, but it is the only thing that makes sense in the kingdom of heaven. And here he is, Schleprock himself, told her, don't go near a dead body. Well, he went near dead bodies. Don't go anywhere near wine, because you're not supposed to be drinking. But there he was, throwing beer parties, having you, you, in the Valley of Zorak, by the vineyards. What? He's already drinking, and he's already going near dead stuff, right? And isn't that just like us? There we are right near our sin, thinking, we do it. We did it. We pointed, we clicked, we slept with, we did something, and then we wait for God. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> Nothing happened. God must not be really mad at me. I mean, I, I said I was sorry. I confessed my sin to God, and He put it away. I'll never forget, going back about four or five years ago, I visited a pastor friend in Miami, he had come to our church a couple of times and taught when we were still in the hotel. And I walked in his office, and the spirit in that office was one of the thickest, weirdest things. We had gone there for, I went to meet him for lunch. We were planning a men's conference, and we didn't go to lunch. We sat in his office, and I just felt this. You ever, think about the movie scene where two people are silent, and all you hear is the clock. And I'm looking at him, and I'm like, what's going on? Nothing. How you doing, man? Are we going to plan to say, yeah, 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 yeah. I, was, I remember this feeling, I got this weirdness. And then after about an hour of weirdness, he said to me, if I confess my sin to God, do you think I have to confess it to man? And I'm like, what did you do, bro? No, 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 I'm just, you know, just theological question. I don't know, I'm not going to tell you the guy's name, but it was only a month or two later that came out that he'd been sleeping with his secretary and had to give up his church to one of his associates. And it's a horrible situation. Horrible. And he thought, I confess to God, I'm cool. Because we do that. We do our sin, and we go, nothing's happening. It's cool. It's cool. We think this is how God works. Because that's how we work. Your kid does something wrong, you swat his butt, he cries, he feels better. He says, you listen to me. You're not a kid no more, adults that are here. And God says, you can do any sin you want. And he's not going to punish you? Oh no, he don't punish you. What? God don't punish you. Do you understand there's a point in time where devotion goes from fear to love? Devotion to fear to love. You fall in love with the Lord Jesus. And at first, for me, when I came to know Christ as my Savior, I was afraid if I did something wrong, He was going to punish me. Because I knew all the mess-ups mess in my life had gotten me messed. That's why I have problems with my relationship, because I'm always messing up. That's why my business, that's why I can make a million dollars and, and I'll lose it in two years. I know it. I know God's punishing me. No, you're just a bad business person, Ryan. And you're a worse husband. Well, God was punishing. No, God didn't punish you. God doesn't punish you. He's waiting for you to love him enough 
not to hurt him and yourself anymore. Because God loves you even more than you love yourself. And the more you hurt yourself, the more you hurt God. Isn't that insane? But God won't break his law for us. There's a law of gravity. When you drop that, it goes to the ground. There's also a spiritual law. And the Bible specifically enumerates God can't bless a mess. You know how many men that I meet and they go, I, can't, I just can't get along with this girl. I just can't get along with this girl. I don't know why. We're always fighting. I go, well, first of all, you're having sex and you're not married. You're asking God to bless a relationship that God can't bless. Oh, I'm always having problems with my finances. Always having problems with my finances. God's punishing me. Now, God's not punishing you. You're punishing yourself. He said he'll sanctify your money. He will bless your finances if you will give him 10% of what you have coming in. Bring it to the storehouse that the poor might have food. Bring it. And your, the rest of your money is sanctified. You can do whatever you want. For, I can't. People just can't do it. 10%. Do you realize that if 10% of the church actually... If 100% of the church tithed 10%, we could pay off the national debt with no problem. I don't even give you the statistics on most churches' tithes. 90% is paid by 10% instead of the other way around. 10% of the church actually tithes and it makes 90% of the church move. You guys don't know this. I mean, I don't, and I didn't want to make a message on tithing, but these lights cost money. This air conditioner, that, knows, that costs money. And we think, well, I won't tie this week, and oh, my finances are okay. God didn't punish me. Well, it'll catch up to you, buddy. Don't worry about it, but he didn't punish me now. And that's exactly what Samson did. He told her, cut my hair off and I become weak like any other man. But did he really believe A, it was going to happen or really was the truth? I mean, listen, he's already gone near dead bodies, no problem. He's already drunk and himself sick. No problem. God will understand. God will understand. God will understand. God will understand. Here it goes. You ready? Thank you. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lord of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. There is the money. Show me the money. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees. Now, I don't know if it's, that's you know, a reference to one thing or the other, but apparently she lulled him to sleep and his head was on her knees. You know, she was sitting down and... Then she lulled him to sleep on his knees and called for a man who had shaved off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before as the other times and shake myself free. And then the saddest verse in the entire Bible. A verse that I hear over and over and over in men's lives and women's lives. You ready? But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. But he did not know. There's a book called True Worship by Warren Wiersbe and there's a fantastic line in that book. He said, the vast majority of American churches, the Holy Spirit could leave and not be there at all and you wouldn't even know it. Everything is so regimented. You know when the service is going to start. You know when it's going to finish. We have to get this, get this out, get this in. You take the Holy Spirit out and everything will keep going right as it was. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. That's a, a, that, that's a verse you read and want to weep when you see the potential that this, this man had. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Now the lords, I think that's a, trying to let him know that some time has passed. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. Dagon was a giant fish. He, was, he had the head of a fish and, and fins, but the body of a man. 
There's a really, I'm telling you, one of the funniest stories we're going to hit in a few months in the book of, I think it's the book of First Kings, where the uh, Philistines steal the Ark of the Covenant. Do you guys remember that story? And then they get, they get boils, they get rats, and they get hemorrhoids. And in order for them to get rid of these things, they made golden rats, golden boils, and golden hemorrhoids. I don't know how they did it. I don't know. And they gave that and the offering back to Israel with the, with the Ark of the Covenant. It's, I'm telling you, it's one of the funniest stories. But the whole thing is surrounding Dagon, their God, and how they put the Ark of the Covenant in. And one day they went there and Dagon had fell and they propped him up. And the next day he was rolled around and, and his hands were broken off. And Look it up, man. It's, it's a hilarious story. Golden. <laughs> So they put his eyes out, they brought him down to Gaza, they bound him with fetters. He's a grinder in the prison, pushing a rock. You know what a grinder is? They take, the, um, they take either rice or um, grain. grain, and they put it, in, and then they put a rock on it. That's, you know, that's the, uh, what do you call it? The wheat waving in the wind. Golden wheat, you got me? You feel me? They put it on there and then they just, and they, you got to just go around and around and around grinding it and then they lift the rock up again, they put more grain and they grind it. That's all he did. They poked his eyes out and he was just a grinder. That's a miserable life. They, they gathered together to offer sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. Dagon it. And they said, you guys miss that? I'm not doing that in the second service. And our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. And when the people saw him, they praised their God and said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. And so it happened when their hearts were merry. And they said, Call for Samson that he might perform for us. How does this guy go from killing a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey to being a clown? A clown. And let me tell you how it happens in Christianity. You ever see these great preachers? And there they are, man, at the top of the world. And they've got it all, man. And there they are on TBN. And at some point in time, they just become clowns. Everybody ever watch Robert Tilton? This guy, man, what a charlatan. All he ever does is ask for money. What was that? What was that other guy's name from the 80s? Little fella. Anybody? Baker. 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 And what was the other one's name? Um, the guy who got caught with the prostitutes over and over again, crying and weaving. Huh? Swagger. Swagger. <laughs> Talk about a black guy. What was the heart of God when he sees that? What do you think it does? He rejoices. Oh, another forgiven sinner. No, he's a clown now. He's a clown. Yeah, put, put Jimmy up there. Let, let, let's watch him perform for us. And the world, they watch the clowns. Here it is. Here he is. The one that multiplied our dead. So it happened when their hearts were merry. They said, call for Samson. They might perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison and he performed for them. And they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women, and the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines from my two eyes. It's great that he's praying, it's great that he's sincere, but he still missed it, didn't he? from my two eyes. Is that what it is? And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which were supporting the temple. Now, listen, they used to build, um, most of the temple structures were built with seven pillars. One, two, three, four, five, six, one in the middle. So apparently these two pillars, he was near, and he got here, I don't know if he was tied to them or he was, you know, by them. And what happened was, and they would have the people underneath and then the people on top it would be almost like a, uh, what do you call that? 
a terrace type of thing. And they're having a temple, and there was Samson, he was performing, and there were people in there, and there were people on top, and they were, ha, 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 there's Samson, ha. There he is, performing, and he calls out to God one more time, one more time, God, just one more time, please. And look at the saddest thing he says. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. And then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Let me die with the Philistines. I don't know how many of you guys have ever asked God to kill you, but I've asked him. I've asked him, God, kill me. I hate myself. I hate what I've become. I hate what I've done. I hate what I'm doing. I, my younger days as a Christian is, is when I first came to the Lord and, and the weakness in my flesh was still all over me. I cried out to God so many times, please God, I don't want to hurt the people who love me anymore. Just let me die. Anybody? Am I alone? Anybody want to be honest enough to say? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's and the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtoel in the tomb of his father Manoah. He had judged Israel 20 years. <laughs> wow. Hey, I wish I could tell you. Oh man, that's the end of that. Whew. Whew. Next week, man, we're going to have a great time because we're going to look at... No. <laughs> I told you guys at the beginning of this thing a couple of months ago, this is a horrible book, man. This is horrible. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes, man. This is, this is horrible. Let's just have a, a lesson learned. Let's not be depressed about it. Let's, like, let's take his life, Samson's life, and say, you know what? That don't have to be me. It don't. Because God's going to give me the strength to do something different. And if you are wondering, you who might be a Christian more than just a couple of years, if you're wondering how, if you're wondering, Ryan, I hear you say that, you know, you asked God to kill you and you were weak and your, house, your life is a house of cards. How do you keep it from falling? How do you stop that kiss? How do you stop that punch? How do you stop that business decision? How do you do it? It's right here. And it's right here. Every single day, I desperately get up in the morning and hit this word and hit these knees. Every single day. If any of you want to call me on that, I write the dates every single day in my Bible. You're welcome to look. In 10 years, I have missed less than 20 days. In 10 years, I have missed less than 20 days doing my devotion. Am I bragging about myself? Yes. Let me tell you why. Because I am weaker than all of you. I am desperate more than all of you. I know I love my life now. And God wants to give you this life. I have so much. I am so blessed. My children, I'm telling you, there is no greater joy in my life. My wife is so beautiful. I love her more today than I ever have in 25 years. And God has shown me so much mercy. I can't, I, every day, I know the great secret of my strength. It is in prayer. It is in Bible study, it is in worship, and it is in fellowship. And every time these doors are open, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. You guys have heard that story? I told it to you. It's a funny one. You'll love it. Get up! We're going to church! I don't want to go to church today, Mom! Get up, we're going to church. I don't want to go to church today, Mom. I don't like those people. Get up, we're going to church. You're the pastor, for goodness sakes. <laughs> if you are weak and you can't figure out why, 
I have not had in 15 years of council ministry now. I got two years of Bible college just to counsel you in, in biblical things. Two years. And I'm going to tell you this right now. In 15 years of counseling people, nobody has ever said, hey, I read my Bible every day, I pray every day, I'm in church every time the doors are open, and I worship God faithfully every single day, and I have no strength. All those things we talked about before. If I told you this, if I told you this, if I told you this, if I told you who's surprised? Who is surprised to find out alcohol will destroy your life? Who's surprised to find out drugs will destroy? Who's surprised? Nobody. Well, how many of you, I said this to the men last night, Last thing, and I'll let you go. If I told you parents here that praying over your children every single day will cause their life to be blessed, how many of you guys don't believe me? That's ridiculous. You can't pray for somebody and have God bless them. How many of you guys would say that? Don't answer that question. You argue with God about that. How many of you guys pray over your kids every single day? How many of you guys pray for your kids every single day? Ask that question and say, wait a second, if you believe the one, then why aren't you doing the other? And I'm telling you, it works the same way personally. If you believe there is strength in this book, if you believe that there's strength on your knees, then why aren't you doing it? Why? Samson was a bloody mess, and I don't want my life to be like that. I don't want to say any died with the Philistines, and look at the great things he did. Not me, buddy. All of us are looking for one thing. You know what that is? To finish well. It ain't a good start. It ain't a strong race. It's to finish well. Paul the Apostle, right before they chopped his head off, said, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. I'm ready. I want that. D.L. Moody, who it was said depopulated hell by six million people, on his deathbed, declaring as his heart stopped beating with his last breath, I see it! It's marvelous! My coronation! And breathed his last. My coronation. Another guy said, Into your hands I commit my spirit. Finishing well. That's yes, breath. Father, thank you so much for your word. The power in your word is outstanding. God, forgive me, first of all, God, for anything that might be considered braggadocious or arrogant or conceited. God, no. Please, as your word says, that we defeat the enemy by the power of, our, uh, the power of your blood and, and the word of our testimony. God, so may my life only be a testimony of your great grace and never my strength, which is so weak. God, I, you have proven to me that in, in weakness, my weakness especially, your strength is made perfect. God, if there's anybody here who is touched by the stories tonight that, that your word declares, God, may our lives be train, changed, transformed. May it be, may it be a, a wake-up call for some of us. May we no more be in the valley of the Gazarites. God, for my sisters and my brothers that are here, may you release us from our sin as your word tells us that you came to set the captives free. May it be so tonight for all that have heard your word in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.